The Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International presents this luncheon lecture. Today's topic, the Pediatric Brain Health and Behavior Protocol. Your presenter, Mary Bro, MD. Good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for coming here and joining us today. I'm, um, we're really excited to be offering this new protocol for evaluating children and teenagers. Um, and it's a, I get to have the opportunity of sharing this uh, information with you first. Um, though really, um, a lot, a lot of credit for developing this protocol needs to go to Dr. Ron Huntinghockey, who worked very diligently to pull all the pieces of this together. Um, and, but I also want to give credit to his wife as well. Who um, It was Mary Jo Huntinghockey who came home from school, <laughs> troubled a little bit by her day, and picked Ron's brain a little bit. And um, I actually happened to be in town that week, and they called me up, and we went and I went over, and we sat on the porch for a couple of hours and talked about, you know, kind of what she faces as a teacher, um, dealing with children and dealing with their families and trying to help them the best that she can. And um, from, he, from there, this new p panels and protocol was, um, was developed. Um, this is kind of the dilemma as I see it and, and what Mary Jo um, herself expressed as well is that you know, parents are, are often quite uncomfortable just accepting somebody's recommendations to give their child medications to, to change their behavior to you know, change their behavior in school or, or change their behavior at home um, or make them be more successful in school. And, um, and this is really difficult because um, you know, in psychiatry is a very unique field of medicine where you know, we use rating scales and we use lists of behaviors and we use somebody's story to, uh, to give a diagnosis. We don't use laboratory, sophisticated laboratory testing in the field of psychiatry. Um, and I know there are some psychiatrists who vigorously defend it as being scientific objective medicine, but I struggle with accepting that. I think it's highly subjective. Um, and, and we're talking about syndromes. We're not talking about diseases. But add to that the further confounding factor, and that is, is that there, it really is hard to find good, reliable information on viable alternatives for families to use. The center represents one of the few places where people can really come and learn, um, both with meeting with our doctors as well as within our extensive library of, of books and our extensive library of videos like the one that this one will have, um, to learn about effective alternatives. And I just want to say one other thing about, about looking at effective alternatives. I was you know, reminded, glancing at an editorial just yesterday evening, that you know, when, as we come up with an individualized approach for any one patient, we can't then easily compare our treatment of that patient to the next person who comes in because it's going to be different. Um, when it comes to treating mental illness, if we you know, want to look at how do B vitamins help mental illness? Well, if we only give that person B vitamins and then don't correct the fact that they've got an inflammatory overdrive, then the B vitamins probably won't work, but we missed something else. And so that's one of the real struggles why there aren't research-driven protocols on this kind of approach to treatment. Why your doctor might say, well, it's not research, you know, proven, um, but now you have a little bit of information to arm yourself to, to tell him why um, maybe we don't need that, you know, I, I don't know that we'll ever have that kind of research for this kind of medicine. So the solution that we came up with, faced with that dilemma, was to provide a, a comprehensive physical and mental health assessment to identify those individual imbalances um, that we know commonly lead to emotional and behavioral difficulties. And even though this protocol is, on the surface, it's very similar to what we're already doing for any co-learner who comes here as a new patient. Um, we did modify it to some extent so that we're doing some things that are going to be unique to evaluating young people. And we also did something that was unique for an, the approach at the center, and I'll get to that a little bit later, in really defining the laboratory panels that we're going to do as part of this protocol. For a typical co-learner, um, most of the time we're not able to tell people ahead of time as they call us for a new appointment what laboratories might be ordered for that person. 
But here we've identified particular labs um, that we know would be very important in working with kids with behavioral difficulties, and we're able to tell people in this in this instance exactly what we're going to be doing. I kind of touched upon this a little bit already in, in identifying psychiatry as being a subjective field of medicine. I think it's important for us to realize that you know a diagnosis, a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder or a diagnosis of depression is nothing more than a label that defines what behaviors are going on. It's just a, it's a label that defines a list of behaviors. Our approach says more about that. Our approach says that we believe that for any of those kind of behaviors, we can find underlying causes and dysfunctions. And what distinguishes our approach as well is our view that while medications can sometimes do a great deal to changing how behaviors look, you know, I, I know because I've used it a lot in my practice that, um, that Ritalin or stimulants can alter a child's behavior and make their ADHD behaviors go away. But over the long run, that does nothing to address what might have caused those behaviors to show up in the first place. And that's the big piece that we really want to be able to identify and be able to help people address. Stephen Stahl is, a, um, is not an alternative provider. He's actually um, very active in um, the neuropsychiatry um, field and actually psychopharmacology field. Um, and even he admits in one of his textbooks of psychopharmacology that we don't know exactly what causes any particular mental illness. Um, and I know with the commercials on TV, it's become, you know, everybody now kind of walks around with this idea of, well, it's a chemical imbalance. And I think lots of people come into a doctor's office or a psychiatrist's office thinking that, well, you test for that, don't you? Um, <laughs> but we don't. Um, we've never proven what chemical imbalance actually causes any particular um, behavioral issue, depression or ADHD. We have lots of theories about that, but none of that has ever been um, scientifically proven. In functional medicine or orthomolecular medicine or integrative medicine, whichever label you want to call it, we take a different approach to the idea of what causes disease. And um, this is very simple, but I, I like simple things. So a very simple model for evaluating what causes a dysfunction or a disorder is to say, is this person trying to handle something and losing the fight? Are they being exposed to something that they can't process? Or are they not getting enough of something they need? Um, so we're going to look at um, how the pediatric brain panel seeks to, um, how we can kind of look at the things that we're going to do in this brain panel and how that might play out. So if we think about the idea of exposures, things you might be being exposed to that you can't handle, um, we now know that we're living in a world that's very, very full of toxins. There's plastics, there's metals, there's evidence of drugs in our water supply. Um, there's microbes, some of which we live with every day. There's bacteria and yeast that, that live in our intestinal tract. But we know that sometimes those microbes can get out of balance, and then that can lead to a disease state. Um, there's medications and drugs of abuse that sometimes we can't handle appropriately. There's a basically kind of poor diet, a diet high in refined foods that then doesn't give us um, adequate nutrient levels and leads to an unstable blood sugar, so your body could be struggling to handle that. Um, food additives, which are known to cause behavior problems. There have been several studies in the last couple of years looking at a variety of food additives in children. Um, there's foods itself and other sources of possible allergens that sometimes people can struggle to handle. And then there's the exposure to stress, which is an enormous factor, as I see it, in, in the lives of a lot of children. So, and, and stress, I loosely define stress as anything that you can't handle. I mean, what one child can breeze through, um, another child can't. So there's the big stresses of trauma and violence, but then there's the other stresses that sometimes we don't even realize. You know, the stress of learning to read. You know, kid A does it fine, and kid B might really struggle with it. We can also look at those deficits. What are you not getting enough of that you really need? 
and that can include any of the nutrients, um, adequate fiber so that your digestive health is working well, enough exercise, um, enough affection or understanding, enough newness and fun things to do in life, enough meaning and purpose. The pediatric brain health panel is going to consist of kind of two basic components and you also have the brochures there in front of you that um, you can kind of look at as we go through this as well. So that professional services component um, is going to include these first steps that I have outlined on this slide. Um, the medical history and a physical um, performance scoring, um, a nutritional counseling appointment, um, a follow-up appointment to get your results, and a group therapy session as well. So let me go through these first steps in, in greater detail right now. Um, that history that will, the first thing is homework for the parents to fill out some of our paperwork, which is a very detailed comprehensive history, which includes, you know, starting back with pregnancy, the birth history, all past illnesses, all past treatments for any kind of um, illnesses, both mental health and otherwise, and a detailed psychosocial history of where the family's lived and how many times you've moved and, and those kinds of things that are going on in the home. Um, a review of the current concerns and the behaviors and what you're now doing to treatment and how the child is doing in school. So social functioning is very important in this, in this review. And then we've, we're pulled out a, some rating scales in particular for us to use. So um, one identifies whether or not the child is having traits that are consistent with a diagnosis of ADHD. And that rating scale also includes some important questions about anxiety and depression and an oppositional defiant disorder. It's a lot of questions that we ask, and you might wonder, you know, why do we ask so many questions? Our, our adult assessment has um, been detailed, and it's been detailed for a long time, but, you know, it's every little detail can play an important factor. Um, and even a detail from many years ago, even in the life of a child, can be an important one that we need to address now. So um, we know that an illness or symptom may not show up right after some exposure or a deficit may not show up for many time, for many time, for quite a long time after the body's been trying to struggle with it. So in that first appointment here at the center, um, we'll be reviewing the results of the history, um, having a detailed interview with the parents and child, and um, we'll have you go to the laboratory. Typically on the second day, though maybe, you know, just depending on scheduling, that could be a little bit later, um, we'll have the dietary consult component of the professional services, and we'll review the diet history that's been provided, and we'll also review the results of the cytotoxic test results, and I'll explain what that cytotoxic test is in a couple of minutes. Um, Following that appointment, some of our other labs, um, we don't get those results right away, so there's a second appointment that would be scheduled two to three weeks after the first appointment. And at that point, then we'd have all the, rec we'd have all the results of the nutritional assessment and be able to go over in greater detail all of those results and pro start providing initial recommendations for getting started on a nutritional program for treatment. Um, the final component of the professional services is going to be an appointment um, with me um, that uh, right now it's kind of in flux a little bit as we have small numbers and we need to meet with people. I'm here a week, a month. Sometimes that might be a, an individual appointment with the parents only. And as we go along and as numbers are um, a little bit bigger, I'm really looking forward to developing a, a group um, component to this and, and have that be an experiential um, group for the parents only to discuss um, parenting issues and family communication and um, as well as other recommendations for psychosocial services. As they are needed, you know, we might be making referrals for family or individual therapy. Um, we might be making recommendations for developmental therapies like occupational therapy or sensory training therapy. Um, some children might need an educational testing done by their school to determine if they have learning problems or if they need um, special education services from their school. Um, we'll be communicating with community providers, communicating with local pediatricians or other prescribers in, the, in town, 
And um, on an ongoing basis, obviously, if folks could choose to kind of continue care with us, having further contact with our doctors for nutritional guidance, we've got um, pain management protocols here, or um, further meetings with me for other kinds of therapy. The role of the lab is, I can't tell you how important that is in, in, the, in, in helping in this protocol. Um, where the history gives us clues about these exposures and deficits, the lab able, enables us to have really hard evidence about what's going on. So the pediatric brain health panel, I've kind of summarized all of the elements of the testing here. Um, the core lab tests um, will include, and I've kind of divided it up into exposures and deficits as I kind of saw it. So looking at possible exposures, things you're being exposed to that you can't handle, the basic cytotoxic, um, fasting glucose, if you're having trouble handling how much sugar is in your diet. Um, hair analysis kind of fits on both sides of this scale. Um, Indican uh, is a marker for bowel problems. Candida is a marker for whether or not you have yeast. And then looking at deficits, we're going to be measuring vitamin levels, mineral levels from a hair analysis, fatty acid levels, um, blood count, and something called urine pyrroles. And I'm going to go into detail about all those tests as we continue here. So the basic cytotoxic test is something we've been doing at the center ever since we've been around, so about 30 years or so. Um, and what it's able to do is identify reactions between your body, and the basic panel includes 24 common foods. We know that food sensitivities cause the body to go into inflammatory overdrive, kind of fighting something that it doesn't need to fight. And those symptoms that can result from food sensitivities are really almost too numerous. We could fill up a couple of slides with all of the symptoms that can result from food sensitivities. Headache, poor concentration, asthma, skin problems, stomach upset, problems with your blood sugar maintenance. And as again, as I said, the list could, could really go on for quite some time. Um, so the, um, this is not something that, standard, that most doctors believe in very much, but it's really one of the keystones of this kind of approach to medicine, and we would think it's really important to identify whether or not you're having this kind of problem. Um, our standard panel um, is an expanded version of this basic panel, and it tests for 90 items, um, and it's available at an additional cost. There's some other labs that you can add into the, the brain panel. Um, Indican is another... I've put it listed it on the exposure um, side of things. It's a chemical produced by certain bacteria that can be in our digestive tract, which we probably normally would have, but if things get out of balance, um, then they'd be kind of considered, you know, they're getting into the undesirable levels. Um, Indican is excreted into the urine, and we can measure how much is in your urine. And as I said, it's, it's evidence of an imbalance in the bacteria in the digestive tract, which can lead to um, abnormal, sometimes toxic products being in the body, and it can also lead to poor absorption of nutrients. Um, we'll be checking for whether or not there's evidence of too high levels of candida, which is a yeast. Again, it's normally found in our digestive tract, but it can become a problem when there's an excess amount of it growing there. Um, exposure to antibiotics or a diet high in refined sugars can lead to candida overgrowth. And nutrient deficiencies in low blood sugar can result when candida levels are too high. We also know that candida can produce neurotoxins, and these neurotoxins are actually suspected in playing a role in, in some cases of autism. Blood sugar control is very important um, in our long-term health. Um, so blood sugar and blood glucose are kind of... Uh, Synonymous. We know that elevations are linked to obesity and inflammation and diabetes, but they're also linked on a day-to-day -day basis as your blood sugar goes up and down to um, a variety of problems. I said, you know, think fussy toddler. I heard somebody once say that, you know, your brain is kind of like a three-year-old, um, and you should treat it. You know, it's like you don't take a three-year-old out all day to work without a snack, do you? You'd be, you'd be crazy. Um, so as our blood sugar kind of goes up and down, all kinds of behavior problems. You know, for some kids it's, it's focusing. For some kids it's anger. For some people it's anxiety. Um, think about yourself after a day where you've skipped lunch and how productive you are or how good you feel come 5 o'clock. Um, uh, 
we think that it's really important that, that everybody strive to have what, what we would call an ideal blood sugar, which is where fasting blood sugar is between 80 and 85. The normal range is between 75 and, and 100. We think that the more tightly controlled you are, the better, the healthy you are in the long term. So we'll be looking at that. So looking for ideal between 80 and 85. Um, but if you're 85 approaching, approaching 100, you're actually what we'd call in the pre-diabetes risk. Um, and if you're 99 and 124, you're actually definitely pre-diabetes and, and you're going to get in trouble if you don't change your life. And um, people are diagnosed with diabetes if their fasting blood sugar is over 125. And we're finding pre-diabetes and diabetes type 2 increasingly in teenagers these days. And, some not, and sometimes in people that aren't even terribly obese. So we're finding it even when people don't look like they're at high risk. The hair tissue analysis can help us look for the minerals that our bodies need, like zinc, copper, calcium, magnesium, chromium, and selenium. It can also help us look for whether or not there's any indications that someone's been exposed to high levels of toxic metals, like lead, mercury, and aluminum. If any of, if any of those toxic metals are elevated in a hair screening, we need to do further testing to look for whether or not there's really, that's really a problem. We can't, we can't make a diagnosis of metal toxicity just based on this hair tissue analysis. All of our vitamins play in a really important role in our brain function. In particular, the family of B vitamins are crucial for taking the nutrients that we take in, as particularly our proteins, um, tryptophan that our body turns into serotonin, um, tyrosine that our body turns into dopamine, which we need for attention and for staying awake and focused. Um, and without those B vitamins being there, the chemical reactions that are necessary just don't take place. They just stall out. Vitamin D, we know, is increasingly important. So in the pediatric brain health panel, we're going to be measuring the vitamin levels for all these things. Vitamins A, C, and E um, prevent excessive oxidation. Our bodies. You know, you're, oxidized, you're actively oxidizing your food now, which is good because you're going to turn that into energy, but that's also a slightly destructive process. So we need antioxidants on board to keep our bodies in oxidative balance. The essential fatty acids are absolutely crucial to brain development and brain function over time. And researchers have proven that, you know, the ancient diet, or even not, not even ancient diets, even diets of 100 years ago, um, we consumed far, far higher levels of omega-3 over the course of our lifetime. Um, and we now know that this can play a role in almost every chronic illness. Um, depression itself, you know, we're finding out more and more, is perhaps an inflammatory condition. Um, the DHA of omega-3 fats leads to brain development. And so we had infant formulas for 30, 40, 50 years without DHA in them. Now we're finally putting them there, but we've kind of played roulette with brain development for a long time that way. Um, DHA plays a role in the membrane of the cell, and membranes are how cells communicate with each other. Brain function is dependent upon cell-to-cell -cell communication. Um, so we'll be measuring um, these fatty acid levels, omega-3, 6, and 9, and figuring out exactly where you are and be able to tell you whether or not supplementing with those fats would make a difference for you. Just a simple blood count, and I used to do these when I was doing a physicals for kids um, as a pediatrician. I don't know, I don't even know that that gets done very often. It seems like the less some kids I've had in my office lately have had physicals in the last few years, but they haven't had any blood done. Um, but with a, just with a simple blood count, we're able to screen for anemia. Um, that helps us get another glance at iron levels in the blood. Um, iron, level, iron is also a, a mineral that's very important um, in brain function. Um, low iron and anemia is associated with fatigue, shortness of breath, learning problems, and, and hyperactivity. Actually, iron treatment, um, treatment with iron for kids with low iron has been known to resolve symptoms of hyperactivity. Our white blood count also lets us look at immune function. It's just at least a screen for immune function by measuring for how many white blood cells. Um, an abnormal white blood count can be associated with you know, immune functions and predisposition for infections. A too high white count can be associated with a predisposition towards allergies. 
urine pyrroles um, are excreted in high levels in certain amounts um, in certain individuals when they're under high stress. And this condition of excreting excessive pyrroles, known as pyroluria, was actually one of the treatable causes of serious mental illness who, that was first noted by um, doctors Hoffer and Pfeiffer, some of the pioneers in this kind of treatment of mental illness. Um, what we know about this condition is if you are excreting high levels of these compounds is that those, that can lead to low levels of B6 and zinc and as we've already said before how important all of those um, compounds are to brain function. So that's the, all of those tests are what's available in the core laboratory testing that's going to be given with the um, the brain health protocol. Um, additional options for testings would include, um, instead of doing the basic cytotoxic, cytotoxic test, um, doing the standard panel, which um, includes 90 foods instead of the 24 that are in the basic. Um, the DMSA challenge test um, is uh, a test that helps us identify heavy metal exposure. If the hair tissue analysis, if that screening is positive, the DMSA challenge can be done in follow-up to further clarify whether or not there's a difficulty with exposures to high levels of mercury or lead in particular, but other metals can be a problem. Um, the glucose tolerance test can be done as a, as a further um, measure if on the fasting glucose we identify a, a somewhat abnormal fasting glucose. The glucose tolerance test tells us better how your body is handling sugar. So you're exposed to a known amount of sugar and then we measure your blood sugar at various times. We measure how much insulin you make as well and we can further refine whether or not you're kind of pushing towards that pre-diabetes or diabetes risk. Um, if we have any concern that we might be dealing with parasite infection for some reason, we can do a comprehensive or, or a stool assessment, um, which is three samples to, to look for whether or not there's eggs or parasites um, infection as a problem. To further clarify whether there are certain nutrient deficiencies, um, if on the complete blood count we had any suspicions for anemia, for a low hemoglobin or a low hematocrit, um, a ferritin level is a more um, accurate marker for iron levels and can help us clarify whether um, iron deficiency is a problem. Um, chromium levels um, can be addressed and chromium can be very important um, in depression in cases of fatigue. Um, low chromium levels can also lead to problems with um, diabetes risk and poor blood sugar maintenance. Um, looking particularly at histamine and homocysteine, which are two compounds that the body normally makes and normally handles, but levels of these compounds can be elevated um, if the B vitamin levels are either too low or if for some reason the body just might need higher levels of them in order to handle these compounds. So um, it can kind of help us address whether how well your body is using the B vitamins. You know, it's one thing to practice here where testing is kind of a given. I think most people who come here are familiar with our lab and sort of know that it's test, you know, that what we do is testing. Um, and back home in Denver, this is a very new idea to all the patients that come to my practice where I don't have a lab in the basement. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, and I think for people that are new to this approach in general, it's kind of a little bit of a struggle sometimes to understand why, why would we do this. Um, uh, you know, sometimes some, some interventions might make sense just for everybody without doing any of this testing, but in order to really know what's, what's going on, as I said, the history gives us clues, but it's until you have the lab data that you don't have the hard evidence. Um, we know that if, if all you did was come to this lecture and go home and not do anything and never have this panel, um, you know, making some changes might make sense for some people, like supplemental omega-3 fatty acids, probably a lot of people could benefit from doing something like that. And certainly, um, most of us, if not all of us, if we're not eating a really whole foods diet, um, 
our bodies and our brains could drastically benefit from shifting away from refined foods um, and, e and eating more whole foods, eating more fruits and vegetables, basically. Now, there is one difficulty about this approach to treating anything, whether we're talking about cancer or fatigue or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And that is, is that sometimes the improvements in behavior that we'd like to see show up um, aren't going to show up quickly. Um, they may develop slowly over months and maybe even over a year. Um, and that can be hard if you're talking about dealing with a child at the time. Um, I think in, in, in that respect, that's where utilizing this program and utilizing other approaches, I mean, there might be some people that using pharmaceuticals will make sense to have that balanced approach, but just because you start this approach doesn't mean that you can't be doing medicines or vice versa. Just because you've already started on Ritalin treatment or stimulant treatment doesn't mean that you can't now start adding in this nutritional approach and use the two and over time maybe be able to use less medicines or over time be able to completely come off of medicines in the future. Um, it is important, I think, especially in dealing with children, that we um, implement some changes slowly. Uh, otherwise, you'll just get a big no um, from a child of just about any age. So um, for the family to work together and start getting these things uh, going and, and doing it you know, in a way that's acceptable for everybody. Um, you know, in, in changing how, what diet you have at your house, I think it's one of the things that can really help along those lines is to you know, have the kid come in the kitchen with you. Um, have the kid go to the grocery store with you. You know, pick out a new vegetable. Pick out that funny-looking fruit or vegetable and, and, and give it a try. Um, and if they've put some energy and have some investment in it, then they're probably more likely to go along with it. Um, as we um, identify maybe those food allergies, you know, and maybe we find out that Johnny's not supposed to eat milk anymore, um, it's really important that we don't single him out, that we maybe try to make the whole family be dairy-free, at least for a while. Um, and that you certainly don't do things like, you know, go out for ice cream and, and tell poor Johnny that he's on the, you know, he's still in the car while, while everybody else has some yummy treat or something like that. Um, but it really needs to be a family affair and have everybody included in that. You know, say here at the center, you know, we're not necessarily going to be trying to replace your pediatrician or replace your psychiatrist. Um, we'll still want you to, to maintain involvement with that person if, if you have a relationship with a primary care physician. Um, you know, we don't provide necessarily emergency care or acute care, um, and it's important for people to recognize that. Um, and we're not going to, you know, if you are using um, stimulants or antidepressants or mood stabilizers as you come here, we're not necessarily going to take over being responsible for, for doing those things. I'll be glad to, as I'm here, to sort of review with you where you're at with those things and, and suggest ways to modify it, you know, help you be able to talk with your um, prescribing psychiatrist, um, some options and, and approaches for using them um, in, a, in a more helpful way, but um, we're not necessarily going to be taking that over from your regular doctor. I wanted to mention some resources that um, you might find helpful in in learning more about this approach or that you might find helpful to share with any skeptic you might know. Um, please don't label my child by Scott Shannon. Um, Dr. Shannon is a colleague and friend who lives in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, and um, this is at least, a, it's a very good overview to, um, to different kind of approach. He actually, the, the strength of, that, of his book is um, really sort of highlighting the problems and how children are diagnosed anymore. You know, diagnoses being given in, in just an hour-long appointment. Um, and not over a series of appointments um, and, uh, and the quick rush to start medication right away when children come into to, for mental health treatment. Um, is My Child's Brain Starving um, by Dr. Murray. Um, I kind of don't like that he has so many references to his own company's products, um, but it actually is a, um, it's an excellent introdu introduction to the concept of food allergies and how to do a comprehensive elimination diet. Um, some parenting books that I um, find very helpful, um, Parenting from the Inside Out by Daniel Siegel, um, Playful Parenting by Lawrence Cohen is an awesome book, um, and I think my favorite of this list is um, Becky Bailey's Easy to Love, Difficult to Discipline is a really awesome book because um, it actually tells us what we need as, as parents 
um, what the skills that we need to have in order to be effective disciplinarians. Um, and you can't come to a lecture by that I do without a mention of energy treatments. Um, Tap into Joy is a book about using EFT for kids. That's great. And Remembering Wholeness um, by Carol Tuttle um, is also a book about energy treatment and, um, and changing our viewpoint on life. Um, and I think it's also an excellent book. And that's it. Um, kind of flew through the slides for today. Um, so we'll stop and see if anybody has any questions. We'll um, come up, we'll bring the microphone to you. It's coming. Yeah, I just wondered how you would increase the omega-3 and, and how much in a child's diet a supplement would be how much or I mean, a, a, a small amount would be about 500 milligrams of, of EPA and DHA combined. Um, though many times in treating, you know, I'll go higher than that, either, in, either without having lab or certainly if I have labs and then I can use the lab to guide me on, on how, I can, how high I should go. Oh, in foods, um, that's going to be in walnuts, fatty fish like salmon or tuna or mackerel. Um, help me out. Green leafy vegetables have some. Um, some um, winter squashes have some. Um, no. Avocados have good fats. Avocados have monounsaturated fats, which are a good fat for us, but they don't have omega-3s. Um, I have heard fish oil being very controversial because it can be contaminated. Cons I, Any I, comment? I, I, um, I'm a consumer lab prescri uh, subscriber, and they did a recent um, review, and I, you know, I don't have a list of all the products that they did, but they didn't find contaminants um, in, in the products that they sampled recently. And they found that most of the products had how much they said were in them. Good. Um, so I, th I think we're pretty safe on, on, on fish oil. Yeah. Does the cytotoxic panel cover any food preservatives or colorings? The basic panel I don't think has any of those on it. The 90 food panel, so that's the, uh, an option for the testing to be done, um, covers green dyes, um, covers some preservatives, um, BHA and BHT, nitrates and sulfur dioxide. Do you recommend to uh, kids the fine gold diet? I, you know, I've not recommended the fine gold diet per se. Okay. Um, the, by doing the cytotoxic testing, we're able to more specifically figure out what each individual might elim should eliminate. Um, whereas the fine gold <coughs> diet is is very stringent and very strict. I mean, it might. <coughs> It might be a value. I mean, it might be a value for certain individuals to be very, very stringent, at least for a while. Um, but you might be, you know, you might be doing an overkill too. What we do with the cytotoxic testing is eliminate foods for a while and then have you retry them at a, at a time away from that. We kind of coach you through how and how to go about doing that. Let her. Um, Up here. Here. No. Um. Put your hand up. <laughs> no. Keep my hand. She up. did. <laughs> I just have you. Have you done many of these panel tests on a lot of children? Have you taken data on them? And I guess I was a pre-K pre-K with disabilities teacher. We're seeing behaviors that are just so out of this world. And I was wondering if there's any common thread you're seeing or any any one of them that is m more prevalent or more prevalent with this kind of behavior or? Um, I mean, over time, and maybe Dr. Ron would be a, a good one to answer that question because, I mean, over time, I mean, he, the center has been here a long time and we've been doing not necessarily this panel with children, but this, the same approach has been used here for a long time. Um, I, I, I don't know that answer about if there's any particular trend or... Um, 
I think it's just the uniqueness of each child and you know sometimes it's a metal problem sometimes it's a deficiency and sometimes it's a food sensitivity or combinations and permutations of, of the above and and then there is the social situation that can't be ignored and sometimes hormonal issues enter into it so it's it's a it's a very complex issue but you have to start to delve into it and I the thing I like about this protocol it is a scientific investigation of of biological and, and uh, biochemical factors that are influencing behavior rather than just simply covering up the problem it's actually trying to uncover it and and deal with it in a realistic way it takes time and it's hard work and it it creates some expense but at least you're actually correcting the problem rather than just uh, you know treating the symptoms and because we've not had a, a particular lab panel that we use for children in the past going forward being able to compare children who participate this way is something that we'd like to do I, I think I didn't mention that the same behavior scales that we use for that first assessment we'll do those in follow-up appointments so um, one of those is something called the strengths and difficulties questionnaire um, which is just kind of a overall view of functioning so we'll be able to compare those results over time and again have a rough estimation because the kids won't be doing the same interventions. Right. We'll have been doing the same assessments, individualized interventions, but then just comparing the improvement over time. Yeah, really yeah. yeah. Do that. Any other questions? Any plan to add this panel to the Beat the Odds? I don't know the answer to that question yet. <laughs> We thought about it, but you know, really, uh, I think it it needs that professional component of helping the parents figure out what to do with the information, just to give people the information, without helping to structure a plan for intervention, would probably not be quite right. So we have that's why we have it at the, this time. I mean, for some of you that don't know, the, the beat the odds, you can kind of self-order that. You know, you can order a panel for yourself and come in. And, and get that done when we have Beat the Odds days um, and then never have an appointment with the doctor here. But as Dr. Ron's pointing out, for, for, for working with children, we'd rather know that you, that you get the professional guidance, that you get the further assessment and the guidance on how to use the information. The preceding program was presented by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International in the Bright Spot for Health Lunch and Lecture Series. To inquire about additional health-related information available on DVD, audio CD, VHS or audio cassette, simply call 316-682-3100 or drop by 3100 North Hillside in Wichita, Kansas. To discover more about the center and what we have to offer, be sure and visit us on the web at www.brightspot.org.